Despite such pedigree, Nana Grimke remained privately haunted by the unanswered questions about her family's past. Questions that lingered in that Warren Grimke haberdashery sign and that deteriorating East Bay Street mansion in Charleston. As she told her friend, Maida Fuller, soon after her return to D.C., indeed there are so many stories that we do not tell ourselves as supposedly, as supposedly, uh, as supposedly wealthy colored people. And I fear that this will be our albatross. We are all lost in a way, she concluded, the future leaders of the colored race. So when I first started working on the Grimkeys, the legacy of slavery in an American family, Nana Grimke's words shaped my approach to understanding this family's long, complicated, and ultimately uncomfortably familiar story. Like many African Americans at the turn of the last century, particularly the so-called colored elite in cities like DC, Philadelphia, and Boston, Nana Grimke was the granddaughter of both the enslaved and the enslaver. Yet she was also the grandniece of two of antebellum America's most famous white women reformers, Sarah Grimke and Angelina Grimke Weld, were two of 13 children born to one of the wealthiest and most politically influential slaveholding families in the South Carolina Low Country. During the 1830s, the sisters earned acclaim amongst New England's anti-slavery leaders for daring to speak publicly against, quote, the peculiar institution in which they'd been raised. In fact, Sarah's 1838 treatise, Letters on the Equality of the Sexes and the Conditions of Women, and Angelina's An Appeal to the Christian Women of the South, published in 1836, both became canonical texts in the anti-slavery and women's rights movements. In 1838, after nearly a year of touring the North, speaking on the duties of white women in public reform, Angelina Grimke became the first American-born woman to speak before a state government when she addressed the Massachusetts state legislature on the need for immediate emancipation and women's right to political representation. After Angelina married the radical anti-slavery activist Theodore Dwight Weld, the sisters moved to rural New Jersey, where they raised Angelina's children, where they ran a series of reform-oriented and integrated schools for children of the abolitionist movement, and where they continued to host women's rights activists like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Known as, quote, the first founders of women's rights, according to their 1970s biographer, Gerda Lerner, the Grimke sisters were lauded by their contemporaries for supposedly, quote, disavowing their birthright and sacrificing their wealth to support, quote, the cause of the slave. Again, these are the facts that we know about the Grimkes, the accomplished black Grimke brothers, Archie and Frank, who led black America at the turn of the last century, Archie's daughter, the brilliant poet playwright, Angelina Weld Grimke, Grimke, and the selfless and supposedly uncompromising women's rights activist, Sarah and Angelina Grimke whose lives have inspired one novel, numerous historical monographs, and seats of honor in national and local women's rights museums across the country. And yet, as Nana Grimke pointed out in 1906, after her visit to the Avery Institute in Charleston, there's more of a tale there than historians and the general public have previously acknowledged. So how was it, for instance, that Angelina and Sarah Grimke professed horror and, quote, feelings of deception when they discovered that their black nephews about their ne black nephews while reading an article in the National Anti-Slavery Standard. This is the story that we get, that they discovered their nephews, they were reading this anti-slavery article, they suddenly uh, stumbled upon the names, and they said, aha, they must be related to us, and the story is they sent the Book Brothers a letter, and then vowed it would support their education. So this is the story we've been told. According to the Grimke sisters, and repeated by countless historians ever since, they selflessly then sacrificed the last years of their life to support uh, their, um, their black nephews. It was this horror at their black nephews, the story goes, that led the Grimke sisters to meet the brothers, to welcome them into their home and into quote-unquote high-class white society in Hyde Park where they lived, and to eventually help pay for their educations at Lincoln and then Archie's tuition to Harvard Law School. But according to all of the available historical records that I read, and given my eye problems, <laughs> there are multiple ones of them, Henry Grimke was a particularly brutal and sadistic slaveholder. As a child, he delighted in banging slave boys' heads against door jams, causing one enslaved man named Stephen permanent brain damage, which eventually meant that the white Grimkeys begged Sarah and Angelina to bring this formerly enslaved man named Stephen to live with them in, in New Jersey. When the Grimke sisters allowed him to come, they knew very well that their brother Henry was the cause of, quote, his fits, and was the cause of the family controversy that Stephen could not, quote, fetch a good price in the marketplace where we tried, tried to sell him. <laughs> 
Sarah, Angelina, and two of their sisters eventually arranged for Stephen to come north. But when he came north, the sisters talked about him in terms that seemingly dismissed their culpability in his disability. He is lazy, said Sarah Grimke. He refuses to work, said Angelina. He is an example of the lazy, laziness and shiftlessness of the Negro, they said, despite all of the work that we have done for them. End quote. Then there was the matter of the Grimke brothers themselves, men who ascended the ranks of the talented tenth, only to reveal in private letters, diaries, and public speeches their disdain for the Negro masses who they claim to lead. Raised by their mother, seen here Nancy Weston, to see themselves as exceptional, <clears throat> to believe that they were colored Westons, and that the greatest blood of the South holds their veins. Both Frank and Archie used the same derogatory language that Sarah and Angelina used when talking about the lowly slave to describe what the brothers saw as the, quote, creeping immorality and, quote, looming irrespectability of what they called the majority of our colored people. As pastor of the 15th Street Presbyterian Church, for instance, Frank transformed the institution founded by John F. Cook at the first, as the first African Presbyterian church. He transformed that church, which had been welcoming to black people of all colors and all faiths and all um, statuses, into what was called the creme de la creme of the colored elite. You could not get into that church, said Elaine Locke, one of its members, if your skin is darker than a paper bag. Archie himself also spoke of the Dominicans he was charged with bringing into the American empire with the same derogatory terms with which his aunts spoke of African-American people who looked and acted like himself. In the Dominican Republic, he referred to them as, quote, a lowly people who would be best off with taking and accepting this gracious hand that the United States has offered them. Indeed, they are in need of guidance from some wealthy Yankee businessman, he said. And as ambassador, he negotiated a land claim with the United States government that led to over 30 years of U.S. occupation of the Dominican Republic. Finally, there is the question of how these men treated the women in their lives. Despite Archie's public support for women's suffrage, and despite Frank's public reputation for supporting the National Association of Colored Women. Frank married Charlotte Fortin, a fourth-generation Philadelphia abolitionist and public intellectual in her own right, but he discouraged her from continuing her public writing after the couple's first and only child, a daughter named Theodora, died in infancy. Although privately devoted to Lottie and proud of her past accomplishments, Frank feared that, quote, the exposure of a pastor's wife could jeopardize the respectability of 15th Street Presbyterian Church. And so Lottie spent the last 40 years of her life as a, quote, colored society lady supporting equally brilliant and publicly-minded black intellectual women like Anna Julia Cooper and Mary Church Turrell. But she herself was forced out of the spotlight. Archie, meanwhile, raised his daughter Nana with every advantage that his money and political influence could buy. Yet his relentless criticism of Nana's passion for poetry and novels, of her supposed laziness in school, and particularly of her, again, inappropriate relationships with women, meant that Nana Grimke grew up constantly failing to meet the requirements of a colored elite obsessed with racial respectability. When Nana fell in love with a man, for instance, an attraction that Archie, Frank, and Lottie supposedly wanted her to have, Archie immediately dismissed it because the man was, quote, too dark brown for our side of the family. The black man, he concluded, would never fit in with our type of society. And so the Grimke's The Legacy of Slavery in an American Family explores these complexities of what the scholar Sadia Hartman calls slavery's afterlife, by asking questions that are as important today as we reap the effects of late stage capitalism and the failed promises of the civil rights and Obama errors. These questions, I would argue, are as important today as they were in the Grimke's time. How does the racial and sexual violence of Southern slavery continue to affect families, communities, and the ways in which black people communicate and understand our blackness? What was the real cost of birthing a post-bellum colored elite from the rampant sexual exploitation of enslaved black women by slaveholding white men? And what does it mean that capitalist accumulation, supposed economic success, and professional achievement have never been enough to deliver African American people and indeed African descended people from America's racial abyss? So I will open it up for questions. I'll, I'll show some images. This is Charlotte Louise Fortin, wife of uh, Frances Grimke, um, again, brilliant scholar in her own right, born in Philadelphia, 1837, and then forced from the spotlight 
um, to becoming a public intellectual by her husband. And this is Angelina Well Grimke, um, the um, um, poet and playwright, and her second cousin, Angelina Weld Hamilton, um, who was seven years older than her, and the two women never met. Um, they look remarkably similar. Uh, Angelina Weld Hamilton, granddaughter of Angelina Weld, Angelina Grimke Weld, uh, became one of the first uh, women uh, doctors in the state of Illinois to run a women's medical school. Um, and was very successful, but it was also, quote, an avowed white supremacist, as she said in 1911 after a horrible lynching in Cairo, Illinois, quote, while my, mother and, while my mother and my aunts and my family legacy teaches me that the Negro is equal, I have seen very little evidence of it in my everyday life. So I will open it up for questions and comments, um, and thank you for uh, listening. Yes, so Theodore Dwight Weld was probably the most famous black, oh, excuse me, white uh, anti-slavery orator of the 1830s. He was famous for, um, born in Connecticut. Um, his father was a relative of the patriarch of the Weld family that we know locally in, in Cambridge, and um, Bill Weld, who became governor of Massachusetts. So there is a, there, they are related. It's not direct descendants, but they are related. Um, and Theodore Dwight Weld um, was famous for uh, forming something called the... Um, um, rebellion at Lane Seminary, in which um, the students at that school in the 1830s um, took a stand that they should be allowed to talk about reform and anti-slavery. They were expelled, and as a result, they founded Oberlin College in the northern part of, of Ohio. So um, the Weld family, um, that side of the family, has a huge sort of legacy in the anti-slavery and reform movement. Questions? Yes. 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 They are. I mean, one of the things that struck me about researching this book is a few things that um, were were shocking as a historian because I couldn't believe that other historians hadn't seen this. So the biggest error you can make as a historian is think that you are inventing something or finding something new. So I would never claim that I'm finding something new, but I would say that the way that people were reading these resources on the white Grimkeys and the black Grimkeys were often skewed through this idea that, number one, the black Grimkeys were exceptional and therefore their lives must have been benefited by the contact that they had with the white Grimke sisters. So that's the first assumption. The second assumption was that the white Grimke sisters, because they did say that slavery was wrong, and because they did peak in 1836 to 1839 as influential, um, sincere white women activists, that somehow that translated into their relationship to black people. Right? So those are two very, um, I would say, not historically accurate assumptions about the time period in which these groups lived, right? Um, the Grimke sisters were anti-slavery activists, they were women's rights activists. But they looked through at that activism through the lens of slavery being a sin, and that they themselves, in talking about them, that sin, were atoning for that sin. And I go through this all in the book about all these scholars who have done wonderful work about the ways in which the Episcopal Church, in uh, specifically in Charleston in the late 18th century, and then the Quaker faith in Philadelphia prior to the 1840s, viewed sin, which was that you are atoning for sin to get it out of the world, right? And that, in a way, is creating a way for the individual to deal with the sin that they are enacting on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, to me, that's very different, right, than saying slavery is an evil and black people deserve equality, right? And that was evident to me in everything that I wrote, I read about the, what the Grimke sisters wrote, right? Um, that is not to say they were not anti-slavery activists because they were, but they're seeing it through this lens. And so then that translates into the question of when they encounter their, the black people in their lives, how does their reaction to those black people who are not enslaved, so once they come to Philadelphia, they, are, they live two blocks away from the heart of one of the largest black, free black communities in the country at the time, Philadelphia. And in all of their writings, where they, they go into all these really, really 
beautiful, intricate details of Philadelphia and who lives on what street and what's happening politically. They never mention the free black people who we know through their letters that they're talking to. And they never mention any of the violence that the black community in Philadelphia went through at least six times between 1834 and the start of the Civil War. Horrendous riots in which the white community went in and basically tore the black community to pieces, pulled people out of their homes and killed them. Like, this is three blocks away from their house. And so one of my, one of my, you know, when I'm asking those questions about what does it mean that you have this legacy of the enslaver and the enslaved, that you have, um, you know, people who are very sincerely against slavery, and yet they have no language and no impetus to talk to and react to black people beyond the fact that black people are a cause, right? That's very damaging, and I saw that from the evidence of the black people who responded to them, right? So when you read the black people who are working with the Grimke sisters, they talk about this all the time, right? The Fortin family, for instance, um, who the Grimke sisters, um, when they get to Philadelphia, you know, they approach the Fortin women who were part of this very well-renowned black family in Philadelphia. James Fortin was the wealthiest sailmaker in the early republic, um, running a sailmaking operation out of Philadelphia, um, helped found the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And the Grimke sisters are, want to dictate to them how they fight against slavery, right? And the black community in letters telling them you can't do that, right? You are a guest in our activism, right? And the Grimke sisters basically not responding, right? And so then the question becomes, when they meet these nephews and they have this interaction with the nephews, and we haven't even gotten into the third nephew yet, which I'm, I always wait for people to ask about him, right? Um, but because, you know, they, their reaction to them on the one hand, publicly, is we have, the, they write to the National Anti-Slavery Standard, we have, you know, um, have given up our lives to serve um, our brother's sin, right? We are going to give all we can to this generation, and they send private letters to Archibald and, and uh, Frank and John, you are going to carry this name forward, right? Privately, though, the judgment that they have on these young boys, who I, I detail in the book, um, the horrendous abuse that they receive underneath enslavement, um, in Charleston by um, their half-brother, Montague. Um, the way that they basically um, are forced to flee um, and hide amongst their free black relatives in Charleston while um, their white relatives are watching them being physically beaten throughout the streets. is very well documented in the newspapers at the time. Um, and white people, as the Civil War is raging, being shocked that, oh, um, the Grimke, Montague Grimke, with the Grimke name, is beating another Grimke who is brown up and down the street and had to, the, the, the sheriff has to be called in to get him to stop. I mean, that's pretty, pretty, pretty blatant, you know, treasure trove of stuff. And so what does it then mean that this stuff is very well, was very well documented, even talked about within the circle surrounding the white Grimkes and the black Grimkes, and yet the family itself doesn't talk about it, historians don't talk about it, the narrative we have is that somehow this was a reunion between the two halves, and they gave, you know, uh, the Grim white Grimke sisters gave their all to these brothers, and yet the historical fact, if you're reading the records, that doesn't happen. And so, one of my questions is, what does that then mean? That, that to me, that's kind of a, a vision of what the United States is, failure to reckon with history of enslavement and racial violence, right? That we kind of like to have this story that somehow, A, two things happen, right? There's horrible th racist, racist things that happen, and then we come together and we join hands and things are fine, right? But what if, you know, we know that that doesn't always happen in the way that we think, right? And that particularly in this family, there's countless examples that that didn't actually happen, despite the narrative that they're saying that it did happen. Um, and as far as the, the black, the, the black room keys went, you know, they are leaders of this society um, at the turn of the 20th century. And... Um, they, in their private letters, Archie and Frank, struggled with the ways that their mother Nancy, and I'll go back to her, um, the ways that their mother Nancy talked about the white Grimkeys and what they actually remembered about being enslaved in Charleston, right? And how they talked about the shame of that as men who were very public fi figures. And then how they passed that shame onto their nephews, right? Instead of being proud of Nancy Weston, 
right, who, and I'll get into it in a minute, basically was the one who was responsible for getting her, her sons out of the South, right? It was not the Grimke sisters. Nancy Weston is enslaved, the Civil War ends, her sons have been brutalized, they return to her. She's living in a, um, a uh, what used to be the Charleston jail, a very horrific area where slaves were kept. She's living in there with the youngest son, her boys come back, they're bruised and battered, and she basically cleans them up and says, you have to get out of here because I know what's gonna happen. White people are gonna react, and it's gonna be violent. And so what you have to do is I have to get you in the school. And she basically takes the boys to this school that's being run by the Pillsbury family. The Pillsburys were a white abolitionist family from Massachusetts and Connecticut. Nancy agrees to clean the latrines in the school if her sons can go to school there for free. And she had taught her sons, sent her sons to school as an enslaved woman, and we can talk about that in a minute, how she did that and taught them how to read and write. So when the Pillsbury's meet them, they're, sh they're shocked. These boys can read, they know Shakespeare, right? They know French. And so Nancy pleads with the Pillsbury's, get them out of Charleston. And that's how they get out, right? Now the, Grimke, the white Grimke sisters would never tell that story. Their story is that they somehow rescued the boys, right? And their reaction to, to Nancy until the day they died, the Grimke sisters died, is one of disdain, right? One of not wanting her kind of around the boys. Right? And so I really wanted to capture, this is a long way of answering your question, I really wanted to capture, you know, that the, the, these are the stories of enslavement and racial violence that are in this country and in any country that is in the aftermath of being a slave society, right? Where you have, it's, it's intimate, it's in families. In families, that is violence. That's violence that goes over and beyond just the violent moment itself, right? That has legacies then for how people then raise their own children, right? <laughs> It has legacies for how um, that specific little sector of the black elite felt about their ties to the enslaved, right? And because the book is so, you know, goes from roughly, you know, the 1790s up to the 1930s, it changes over time, right? So um, Archie and Frank had a very different view of blackness when they were struggling students at Lincoln University. And then they kind of make it, and they have a different view of blackness once they get to um, their status, right? And then they have a different view of blackness once the depression hits, and Archie then is dying, and he kind of dictates all of these violent things from his past to his daughter on his deathbed, right? So I, I know that I know sort of those those answering your question. I think I think the book seeks to answer those questions. I think one of the biggest lessons I I took from reading you know, all the thousands of, of pages and you know, very horrendous stuff um, in terms of the, the Grimke brothers' experiences, um, was that you know, this idea of racial respectability often has never saved black people from white violence and reprisal, right? Um, despite the fact that you have the black Grimke family that is achieving and doing all these things and yet their, their life story kind of ends in, in, in the way that it ends. And so that, to me, would indicate that, you know, we're, we're at a, a moment in these post-slavery societies where we've never come to terms with that, that aspect <coughs> of enslavement, right? Yes? Um, a couple of questions. So, um, first of all, if Nancy Weston educated her children, how did she learn if she was a slave, number one? Number two, who, who was the father of her children? So Nancy Weston, um, this is an image of her. Nancy Weston um, was enslaved to the other big slaveholding family in Charleston, which was the Weston family. Um, and Nancy Weston, uh, you know, one of the stories that's often told about Nancy Weston is that, oh, she was enslaved to this man, the Grimke sister's brother named Henry F. Grimke. He would have freed her if he could have, but he couldn't, and they were actually kind of in love, and then he dies, and the boys were actually free. There's no legal or, or, or um, foundational evidence that that's true. That's an invention of the Grimke sisters once the brothers were free, right? What we know happened, what all the indications are in terms of the records, is that Nancy was enslaved to this Weston family. I haven't been able to tap down exactly when she was born, but it's around 1810, 1815. That Weston family uh, was owned by a man named Plowden Weston. Plowden Weston, at the time of his death in the 1820s, owned 565 people. He freed 20 of them. 
there are historians who have studied the Weston family and um, makes the very you know logical conclusion that he freed those because those were his biological children. One of those children was named Anthony, or no, named Tony changed his name to Anthony. One of those other children was a woman named Lydia Weston, who was Nancy Weston's sister. At least that's how Nancy Weston referred to her, short of DNA evidence. I can't definitively say they were biologically sisters, but most likely they were. Lydia Weston and Tony Weston and those 20 were freed, and they became part of this free black community, um, very prominent in Charleston. There's great research that other historians have done on free black communities in the South. Um, a wonderful historian named Chakrabari Myers, who did a great book all on um, free black women negotiating their lives in Charleston, right? And she covers the Weston family. And so Nancy was related to this family. Nancy was never freed, though. So Plyon Weston frees 20 of his over 550 slaves. The rest he sells. One of those people who was sold is in the records as Nancy, right? I, as a historian, given the date and given the age, I'm saying and assuming and I'm making the historical, um, unless I see otherwise, that this is, this is Nancy. She somehow ends up as a teenager working for a relative of the Grimkeys called the Smiths. And through that, she sees the Grimke family for years and years. She eventually, heartbreakingly, was sold once more. And at the time, had a child, a boy. He was sold or died, and her other brother was sold and died. And then she sold back to the Grimke household to become um, a nurse in the um, Grimke home. At the time, Henry F. Grimke, the white Grimke sister's brother, again, is notoriously kind of this ne'er-do-well in the family. All these horrendous documentation of the parents are worried because he's even too violent for Charleston's terms in terms of how he treated enslaved people. He goes to the Citadel, he gets kicked out, he go travels to New York, um, he gets married, first wife dies, he finally returns back and he says, I'm gonna be like an upstanding person. Marries again, has four of his own children, that wife dies and then says, I'm going to take an enslaved woman into the countryside and basically reinvent myself. The woman he takes with him is Nancy Weston. Right? That's very, very well documented. And that's who's the mother of, she then proceeds to give birth to Archibald Frank and the younger son, John. Um, the fascinating and heartbreaking thing about that is that Archie was born in August of 1849. Uh, Henry F. Grimke at the time records this in all of his um, ledgers, but within three months of Archibald's birth, he does a codicil to his will in which he says that Nancy Weston, who he's now had a sexually coercive relationship for about 10 years, is a girl. She is not to be considered free, right? He writes this in his will, right? And that any children she should have by whoever, he doesn't say himself, but whoever she should have children by going forward, those children are enslaved and they are the property, along with Nancy, of his son Montague, right? So to me, that is a very telling sign, right? That there, this romantic story that we have that somehow, you know, Henry F. Grimke, they were kind of had this lovely relationship or there was something that was, you know, he, he kind of uh, chilled out a little bit in his later years. There's no evidence that that is true. In fact, there's evidence to the opposite. So that's, that's uh, Nancy Weston's story. As an enslaved woman, so, so her, her husband or her, her, her common law husband and Charleston had, South Carolina had certain laws in the books that um, before 1821, if you were a white man and had children with a black woman, there were still legal avenues you could take to protect, quote unquote, the children you had with that woman. By 1840s, those laws had been squelched off the books. One of the people who wiped those off the books was Henry Grimke, right? He's a lawyer in Charleston at the time. So again, very conscious, you know, legal efforts by himself. Um, he dies in 1852. Nancy is left with these three toddlers. Archie's born in 1849, Frank in 1850. She's pregnant with her youngest son when Henry dies. Henry's um, um, white son is away hasn't come back, it's kind of this near low no one knows where he is. And so the remaining white Grimke family, the sisters of Sarah and Angelina, take Nancy and her three toddlers and tell them, well, you're not free, um, but we don't know what to do with you and we're kind of disgusted with you. Choose how you'll survive in Charleston. And she finds her Weston relatives, 
um, who built her a house on Cumming Street, and I gave a talk in Charleston um, about two weeks ago, and so I could go down Cumming Street, which is now this beautiful like boutique area. But what was fascinating was seeing the area that Archie describes as where the house on Cumming Street where they lived. It's basically this shack. It was one room, and she was allowed by the Grimke sisters, the, the Grimkees who were still in Charleston, she was allowed to work if she gave that money to the Grimke family. And so she did laundry, and she gave part of that money to the Grimke family, and she took part of that money to pay a white Presbyterian minister who taught black children, right? And so that's how her sons got educated. She herself never learned how to read or write. And this was a glaring, again, we talk about silences in families and violence in families. This was something that Nana, the playwright, she's a, she's a teenager. She lived um, from about age 13 to 18 in the house in D.C. with her grandmother, this woman who had been enslaved. And one of the questions she asks her father over and over, and Archie refuses to answer, is well, why can't grandma read? Right? Why is she the only one of you who has a southern accent? <laughs> right? And nobody will tell her, right? And when she keeps acting, actually, Frank tells her, well, those are the bad days in Charleston. We don't talk about it, right? For a family that was so well-educated into books and into reading, the striking thing to me as a historian is that nobody in that Grimke family, Nancy Weston, never learned how to read or write, right? And she actually talked to her sons about how the Grimke sisters, um, when they left, refused to give books to her specifically, right? Might have given it to other enslaved people, but again, as slaveholders, you can choose who gets kind of what. And so they refuse to kind of give her, give her that. So it's a very fascinating, you know, I think one of the things that, the other things that comes out of this book is the ways in which black and en enslaved women um, sought to negotiate their ways within these horrendous circumstances that existed. And Nancy Weston was definitely one of those people, right? She was um, determined that they would learn how to read. She was determined that um, slavery would end, right? And... Um, she didn't leave the South until Archie, after graduating from Harvard, could pay for her to come north. So the, the Grimke sisters, the white Grimke sisters, the brothers keep asking, we're worried about our mother. You can't really tell in this image, but she was paralyzed in her arm from the shoulder down to her side. So the arm that's like on her, on her, on her uh, lap. And the white Grimke family used to taunt her, right? If they were to sell her, she wouldn't sell a good price because she was disabled in her arm, right? And so um, she's stuck in Charleston. The white Grimke sisters agree to educate the Grimke brothers, say nothing about their mother who's living in Charleston, who's paralyzed, who as reconstruction happens is seeing like Knight Riders and the Ku Klux Klan and all these things. And Archie begs with them, can you give me, loan me the money to bring her here? And they say no. Right? So again, the complicated relationships within this family. And again, it's very well documented in all of the letters between the, between the um, Grimke sisters, their family, between the brothers, between the brothers and the white Grimke women, between the white Grimke sisters and um, friends of theirs who ask them questions about, well, how did these boys come to exist? And Sarah's response is, well, it's too horrible for us to talk about, right? <laughs> yes. sort of what you were talking about before about like finding out these real stories as opposed to the mythology mm -hmm. of, of um, the anti-slavery movement and the um, history that we all um, that makes us feel good mm -hmm. about how people can somehow come together and change and do good things. And then when we don't have that mythology to um, help us to sort of understand these issues, and we are left with, well, they really didn't do the things that, they, you know, everyone was horrible. Like, nobody <laughs> was good, right? Like, what do, we, what do we do? Do we find other stories, or do we, how do we use the story once it's broken, I guess? I, mean, I, I would say um, one of the things I want to do with this book is not make the very kind of simplistic argument, well, well the, the white Grimke sisters were bad. Um, they did horrible things. And therefore, they're 
uh, feminism and anti-slavery was insincere. Because what we should take is that they were very sincere. They were very eloquent in what they're saying about slavery and women's rights. And at the same time, those two things can coexist. You can be somebody who was a horribly racist and cruel person to actual black people, right? Again, the black people in your family, the black people you encounter, and yet you can be somebody who speaks very loftily about the rights of black people as a whole. And you can believe that, right? Um, I think that's kind of the, the story, and I think we're kind of in a moment like that, right? Where, where there's arguments now about, well, so-and-so said this, they did this, um, it's, it's, it's more to, to dissect what does that then mean. And I, wouldn't, I wouldn't argue that it means that everybody was horrible. I would argue it means that all of us are kind of still living in the aftermath of this stuff, right? Even though we think we aren't, or even though we think, well, somehow, you know, if I were in that situation, I would have acted differently, right? Or, you know, the aftermaths of slavery are so far away you know, I don't really have any, you know, um, I'm, that doesn't really enact in any way in my own personal life, right? Um, but, you know, I would argue writing this book that it does, right? And um, I would say that, again, I, that doesn't mean that, you know, you can't, I mean, alongside the Grimkeys, both the black and white Grimkeys, are, are brilliant ideas for change. You know, Archie Grimke helps found the NAACP. He founds the American Negro Academy, right? The One of the foremost and foundational black intellectual societies of the, you know, the 20th century. Um, Frank Grimke is running this church, and the church is very exclusive, but that church actually was the only church to help black people in D.C. during the riots in 1919. It raises thousands of dollars. When, when um, Washington, D.C. erupts in violence after World War I, that church is the one that actually housed people. So well, I guess my point is it's a much more complicated story. I, I know that we like to... Um, kind of think of, oh, who's good or bad? My niece is three, and it's like, so-and-so's good, so-and-so's bad, right? <laughs> Watching, you know, Disney cartoons and stuff. This is the evil one, this is the bad one, right? This is the good one, this is the happy one, this is the sad one. And we all just know from our daily lives that that's not true, right? We, we know that's not true, right? Um, and so I would ask, you know, when we're talking about the legacies of slavery, the legacies of enslavement, of colonialism, right, of how these affect communities and people, um, it's, I think it's very healthy as, for us to, to act in the world from knowing that those, what we're acting from is very is complicated, right? And that there's good, there's bad, right? Um, and we're all living the aftermath. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think, I think it kind of, I think, you know, I, I really wanted in this book to, to understand and to shine some type of light for my own understanding of these, com these complexities. You know, I started writing this book or thinking about this book when I was working on my last book, um, right after you know Trump was elected, and I was like, you know, there's there, there, you know, my own politics aside, I was like, I'm not particularly surprised, right? Um, I, I'm more surprised that we are surprised, right? And it's like, have people just kind of not been paying attention to like the last, you know, forty something years, right? So, you know, that was, that was, that, and so the same thing with the Grimkeys, right? They're, they're, it's like they're doing something, you know, what's the definition of insanity? You do something over and over again and expect a different result, right? This was like the, oh, the heartbreaking thing about reading about this family, right? Every generation, they're doing the same exact thing and then they get a disastrous result. I mean, one of the things I go to in the book is the Grimke sisters' relationship with Angelina's own biological children, which was all kinds of crazy, right? Right? So she's, She's a reformer. They're educating other people's children. By all intents and purposes, the Grimke Wells run a wonderful, progressively educational little like school in New Jersey. And they educate black children and white children and uh, girls and boys. And those kids go on to become, you know, uh, statesmen and all these different things. That, that's true, right? Behind it, though, Angelina Grimke Weld um, was a mess. Probably... Um, this is from the 21st century perspective, due to postpartum depression and severe um, um, a distended uterus um, that they could not fix. So she's in intense pain for about five years after her second child was born, bedridden. Her sister Sarah and her husband basically take charge of taking care of her children. And she had all these weird ideas about her children. At one point, her, her son, uh, and she says in her letters home, 
She'd never been taught how to take care of children because black people did everything. She doesn't know how to change them, right? She doesn't know that when a baby cries, you have to feed it. Because she was used to when a baby cries, you give it to the black woman who's the wet nurse. And so that's, that's deep. Like, that's, that's like on a, on a level that we don't talk about in terms of the legacies of slavery. And her oldest son almost starves. Right? Because she's just like, oh, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to do it myself because I'm... And I, let me see, I'll just give him... At one point, it's horrible. She gives him barley. Like, he's two weeks old. Like, she takes barley from the garden and she's putting it in this... Um, cloth and she's putting in the baby's mouth and why is he losing weight and finally Sarah says um, goes to an, an ensla formerly enslaved black woman who had been enslaved um, to the Grimke family huh. named Betsy and says what do we do and Betsy says you have to actually feed him like milk this is all this is all in letters like this is this is wow. this is what you know th this is this is the legacies of this stuff right and so through that she has this very weird relationship with her own children She's a feminist, and yet she has a daughter um, whose name is Sarah uh, Weld, who, when the daughter decides to go to high school in Cambridge, she wants to go to this girl's school in Cambridge at the time, located in Central Square, um, and they won't let her go because they say, well, your responsibility as the girl in the family is to take care of your brothers. And I was like, what? You're the Grimke sisters. <laughs> this shouldn't be the way you're talking to your daughter, but that's, I mean, that, that's the complexities of, of, human, of human beings and and uh, rights and living in sort of this type of type of system. They tell her not to, and so she doesn't go to school. Oh. She, she drops out of school, she spent time taking care of the other child in the family named Theodore who probably suffered from some form of mental um, illness from the time he was a little child, was hearing voices, um, um, started to suffer from severe um, seizures. Uh, they actually moved to rural New Jersey because they believed the air would help him. They then realize it doesn't help him, they put them on, him on this all-carrot diet. I mean, I was reading this stuff, and I was like, oh, God. All-carrot diet, he then suffers from severe dysentery. Um, they're trying to get him help. They believe that maybe he's, he's possessed by some type of devil. I mean, and all I could think was that this, these are the Grimke sisters in rationality, and yet the way that they're reacting and relating just in their own day-to-day -day lives is, would not sort of match up to what we know about their public persona. But that's, that's the story that, you know, I was more interested in, right? Um, there are three, their so, oldest son, Charles, completely disavowed being a reformer, so he went to Harvard. Um, his parents are very excited when the Civil War happens because they're like, oh, you're gonna be like your classmates in our school and go fight for the Union. He says, I don't believe that either side is right. The North is just as bad as the South, and besides, you know, I'm, I, I'm not gonna participate. I, I will support, however, France and their invasion of Mexico, <laughs> right? <laughs> And the parents are like, you know, are very embarrassed because all their friends, like William Lloyd Garrison is a pacifist, yet his son joins the Union, right? All of these people. And so it's, it's, it's all at that level. And then they, they could never, they then, the way they then talk about their own children is that they are failures. It's because they're Southern. And somehow, they don't know how it happened, this Southern blood got into them and made them poor citizens, right? Yes? Questions regarding the complexity. No, it's, I don't want to be simplistic, but I think of it as, is it more balanced as an intellectual mistake, a spiritual mistake, a cultural mistake, uh, a um, psychological mistake, that these white people think they're basically white saviors and they're also white supremacists at the same time. And who was it at the very end? I got here late looking for parking. You said as I came in, somebody said they're glad they're white supremacists. One of the well, this, this is, um, this is uh, uh, Angelina oh, Hamilton. Hamilton. Yes, she, is. Okay. she is the granddaughter of Angelina Weld. Angelina Grimke Weld. Yeah, and she, she herself, though, when you, when you see her, so she's, the, what was fascinating is that these two are both called Nana. The, the, the Grimke sisters, however... Um, or uh, referred to Archie's daughter as the Black Nana. And they referred to Angelina Weld Hamilton as the Good Nana. So, yeah. Right? So from the time she's a very young child, Nana, who becomes the playwright, grows up hearing this about herself. Right? That she is, she is, the, she is the Black Nana. And that she has this distant cousin who I never found any evidence that they met. Who lived in Michigan and was the good Nana, right? This Nana was, you know, brilliant, graduated from high school at 13, 
wants to become a doctor. She finds a black, uh, uh, excuse me, a white doctor in Michigan who agrees to like apprentice her. She then goes to medical college in Philadelphia. She then returns to Illinois. She founds all these hospitals for women. Amazing stuff, right? And then, and yet she's living in rural Illinois when all these race riots are popping up. And so I was like, well, where, what? Like you're you're in the same town next to Cairo where there's a horrible racial riot. Um, in uh, 1916, right? You're literally living in that town, which is called Anna, Illinois. Anna, Illinois is a notorious sundown town, which we can get into in a minute. That's where she retires to. And her only response to the racial violence is that this looks like a good place where I can bring my father to retire, right? Even though the people in the town are a little rowdy, right? It's a beautiful countryside, right? And so it's, it's, I, 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 I think that, I think it's a lot of, dissonance, right, in terms of um, the relationship between um, particularly this white family that had so many privileges and their actual interaction with people. And I tried to, in the book, find foils for them, right, meaning trying to find people who actually attempted to do something different. And there are a lot of examples of other people, so you can't have that, that argument, oh, they're of their time, right? So one of the families that I profile is the Purvis family, who intermarried with the Fortin family. The Purvises were an equally wealthy white slaveholding family in Charleston. The patriarch of that family had three sons with an enslaved woman. 1820s, he starts to realize the writings on the wall. Charleston is rewriting its laws. He immediately um, flees to Philadelphia and provides for his sons, right? And he tells his sons that they are the ones that have to be involved in abolition because he doesn't know. He's a, he's a slaveholder, right? As much as he believes slavery is wrong, he's like, my, my black sons need to go to school so they can be the ones who go to like the AME church and, and help lead protests. And his sons do. They become the Purvis brothers who are very famous black abolitionists in Philadelphia. And he, the, the white father basically says to them, I, I, this, I can't be involved in this, right? I can support you, I can give you money, I can do all that type of thing, but me showing up and telling this church, black church, what to do, right? So that's an example of somebody of their time so it's a completely different way of, of dealing with the circumstances. And yet, the, you know, the choices we make often can dictate, you know, we, life is about choices, we make choices, right? And so I, I'm hesitant to say, well, they were of their time and it's showing, you know, how slaveholders, you know, like, like, it, it's haunting them in a way and yet there were all like, these examples surrounding them, particularly in Charleston, of white men and white families who did something slightly different. And the grim keys, what was fascinating is that they chose not to. Yes? I was wondering if you could talk more about the story that like the Grimke sisters gave something up. Like, was there anything that they actually lost in their participation in like the anti-slavery movement? So that's a good question. Somebody asked me at the, another talk. They were saying, you know, and this was in Charleston, and they were saying, you know, we had been taught that they were like the good, this was a white person saying, the good white people who were slaveholders in Charleston. Like, that's the, that's the myth that's happened in the past 10 years, you know, they have the museum and they have wonderful archival work they're doing, so all this type of stuff. And she said, but even I as an archivist, I would read the records and be like, well, that, that can't be right because the records I'm reading don't match up to what we are saying here in Charleston about this family. Um, the, so the Grimke sisters, one of the fascinating things was tracing their bank records and how it is that they're financing their trip to the north. And so their father, um, the patriarch of the white Gripke family, died in um, 1819. When he died, he left all of his money and his slaves to his wife and his children. The wealth of the Grimke family um, was tremendous, right? Again, they are amongst the top 2% of slaveholders in Charleston at the time, and Charleston was a very wealthy slaveholding society, right? They owned at one time five separate plantations, right? and four mansions in downtown Charleston, right? Um, and so he leaves all of that to his wife and to his children. He leaves to his wife that she is to decide where the slaves go, and at that point they had over 200, right? And he leaves to his daughters all of these shares in the proceeds of that sale, all of the claims to the property that they own, right? And then gold. And basically says, that's for you to basically use as you see fit. So the, the Grimke sisters, Sarah and Angelina's story, is that they disavow and they, they get rid of their birthright uh, to make their way to the north. Angelina or Sarah arrived in Philadelphia and lived with her other sister 
who receives her share of the inheritance. Sarah has her share, and they use it to buy this mansion in, um, in uh, Philadelphia, right? So the myth that somehow they left Charleston, the disavowal by their family leads to like impoverishment was just not true, right? They live off of this through the 18, till the Civil War ends, right? And Sarah Grimke was a brilliant businesswoman. And so she took that money, um, again, from the sale of slaves and the parceling out of her family's wealth, and she invested it now in free labor enterprises, right? So her story about herself was that I'm not making money from slavery, I'm making it from investing in like the mills in, um, in uh, Philadelphia, or I'm making, getting money by investing in um, the free produce movement, right? Yes, but where did that initial pot of money come from, right? Um, and that's, that's pretty bad. That was, again, one of those things that I was looking at as a historian. I went to my older historian friends and was like, am I reading this correctly, right? That this is, you can see a clear trace that they are not going to Philadelphia broke, right? Their family may have cussed them out and said, we don't want to talk to you, but they're writing to their family through the Civil War, right? Yes? I, I wondered um, if you could talk a little bit about the change perspective between, clearly, you have access probably to this, many of the same original documents that Gilda Lerner did, and the story is different. It's much richer and fuller and more complex than mm -hmm. the, and was that because of her Lens as a feminist historian? Or? I think, so I think one of the things that was fascinating to me, and I was, somebody was telling me, oh, you should write an article, but I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you should write an article about how people read primary sources differently based on the context from which you're working from. Yeah. So Gerda Lerner was a feminist historian researching in the 1960s at a moment when a lot of the, the um, archive that's at the University of Michigan that I relied on, on heavily, um, which has all the Grimke Weld family papers in it, um, a lot of what she was reading was, you know, 50% of it was true. If you, count, if you didn't look at it in the context of the time period. So that the famous letter where the Grimke sisters say, you know, they discovered their brothers, their, no, excuse me, their nephews, and that, um, you know, they were going to, you know, give up everything for these nephews. Yes, they say that in the letter. I would say as a historian, but is that true? You can never take what people are saying in that document if you have other documents that are going to support the document you're looking at, right? I did the same thing for the Grimke brothers. When they're saying, oh, Archie went to Dominican Republic and wasn't he fabulous? I was like, well, what did the Dominican people think, right? <laughs> And no, he was not fabulous, right? And that was very well documented there as well. That he was, you know, he was seen as like this, this dandy who came down and brought in American exploitation to the Dominican Republic. And yes, he did, right? Even though the narrative that he's giving and that the black press was giving, oh, he did all these wonderful things. Right? So I don't think it was that um, a previous historian is like lying or they're doing something, you know, nefarious. It, it really is the way that people look at sources, the way you're taught to look at sources the way you're taught to look at what is not in the source, right? Letters, um, when uh, a lot of what I looked at was at Moreland Spingarn at Howard University, a fabulous archive that has all of the Grimke brothers um, and Angelina Grimke, uh, Weld Grimke's, all of their letters, everything they've ever written. And one of the things I went into, which again, caused part of my eye problems, is that um, Angelina Weld Grimke um, wrote constantly to her family asking for the truth about her family. It was heartbreaking. Thousands of letters. From the time she's like eight until her father dies. And nobody will tell her anything, but when they do tell her the thing, it's like these little tidbits of things. And I was talking to my family on Thanksgiving last week. I was like, this is what families do often. Right? Oh, I already told you that story. And someone's like, no, I, I never knew like you suffered from polio. Like, nobody told me that, right? Oh yeah, I already told you that, right? It's, it was that kind of thing, but I was reading it like in time, and I was like, this is like infuriating, because as a story, I, I know what they're not telling her. I can't say that they're doing that on purpose, but I also know that, you know, when they tell her, they don't remember if their um, mother was free or not. That's a lie. Yes. Yes. So I think. 
hear her story and a story that obviously compared to these other women's stories was not told and I was just wondering if you could say anything about that. Yeah. I mean, Nancy Weston, I, I always, and I say this in the um, footnotes, and I say it in the beginning, and in the, you know, when I'm describing her life, you know, we don't have anything written by her because she could not read or write. So to take, you know, what I'm saying is a story and that I'm kind of taking from the historical record as it exists. Um, one of the things I, you know, that's very well documented from the brothers' point of view is um, that their mother was always sad. And there's a moment in, in Frank's life where he's, he's at the end of his life where he's interviewed by a black newspaper who's asking him, well, isn't it great that you like rose from slavery to these heights of success? And he says, yes. And the and newspaper is asking, well, what can you tell us about your mother? She was like this Madonna of the South, which was a famous art article they wrote about their mother. And he said, yeah, but, you know, um, Madonna's used to smile. And I was like, okay, that's kind of <laughs> an odd thing to say. Madonna's used to smile. And they ask him all these questions, and he says, well, I, I remember my mother um, smiling twice. Once was when I got married, so he gets married to Lottie Fortin, and the second time was when his fir her first grandchild was born. And I never remember her smiling, right? I don't remember her being a particularly happy person. So it was a story, I was like, well, that's kind of, you know, that's a telling way. And, and Archie then says the sim similar things when he's talking about his life. Like, oh, it was your child, like, oh, it was great, but, you know, um, I, never, I never saw my mother, he tries to make a joke of it, I never saw my mother's teeth because she didn't smile. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then we'll go back there, yes. So, I noticed a parallel that William and Red Trotter is from Hyde Park, or lived in Hyde Park. Yes. The Virgin Sisters briefly lived in Hyde Park. Are you writing a third book that's about Hyde Park? <laughs> <laughs> well, what was, what was fascinating, I mean, I, I, when I started researching Trotter, and the Grimke name just kept pop everything I read, the Grimkeys were also in, the in these little circles that they traveled in. And then when I found out they lived in Hyde Park, I was like, whoa, you know, what is it about this area? So the next book is, you know, I don't know, it's like shaping in my brain as we go, but it will probably have, you know, more of Greater Boston and stuff in there. Um, but yeah, the, the Hyde Park connection was, was big. And Hyde Park was um, interesting because it was planned by this group of reformers. <laughs> to be like this bucolic place outside of the city. That's why it was, it was created. And so you had, for about 20 years, sort of these very idealistic reform people, white, but then a few scatterings of black veterans who moved there. And that's why they, why they moved there, right? And then it's eventually annexed by the city of Boston in 1912 and all this type of stuff. But it's, there's like a fascinating history to be written just about that kind of 20 year period there, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, me. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, to what extent have present day descendants gotten to either input into the work or even react to your work? And then, just because you like, um, you have this interest, if you don't mind saying what happened to John afterwards, that'd be great. Okay, so, so excellent. This will answer your first question. So, there were actually three Grimke brothers. The youngest one, John, is the one um, on your right. Um, and John was, had just turned 13 when the Civil War ended. Um, and was when the Grimke sisters discovered the two oldest sons at Lincoln, um, John was still living in Charleston. Um, they agreed initially that John should go to Lincoln University, which is a, an all-black college in rural Pennsylvania. They sent him there to go to school with his brother. This is the only image of the three of them that I found of them together when they were at um, um, Lincoln. And the narrative that everybody, the black side and the white side, had of John was that he somehow couldn't measure up, right? He was a dullard. This is the word, term that Archie used about his younger brother. He's never come around um, me and Frank, and therefore, you know, we just have to tolerate him, right? The white Grimke sisters, their voice, their idea about him was that he had failed in some way. He couldn't keep up intellectually. This is the story, and actually reading other historians, this was kind of accepted as truth. We don't know what happened to him because he, like, didn't do what he was supposed to do. I found no evidence that he was a bad student. He got the same exact grades at Lincoln that his older brothers did, right? He actually taught school in Maryland um, and was beloved by this community in Culver, um, Maryland, right? And taught there and was known as, uh, uh, taught Shakespeare and was known as this great teacher. What, something happened around 18, 
70, I don't know what, again, I, I, in, the, in the footnotes I kind of say, I, I can't definitively say, where the Grimke sisters started to refer to him as being less intellectually capable and talking back and asking questions and not being a good student. And so they stopped funding him. They basically said, you have to support yourself. And so he's formerly enslaved. His mother is still in Charleston. His brothers are struggling students, don't have any money yet. He then um, went to New York. Uh, the most heartbreaking, one of the heartbreaking things is that John then um, tried to style himself a member of a group of black New Yorkers who could claim they had been there since the 1780s. And he became the president of this group. And they then find out that he's a Grimke. And they ask, are you related to the Grimke who just graduated from Harvard? He says yes. They then kick him out of the group. This is documented in the black press, by the way, which is horrible. They're like documenting, oh, this, there's this one brother, and we found him, and he's not actually a New Yorker. He's a Charlestonian, right? And he's lying. He then kind of drifted. Um, he ended up in Florida working as a waiter. Um, the restaurant he was waiting at was attacked by the Klan. He then left um, there. He asked his brothers for money. They tell him no. Um, and so he kind of drifts. He died then in 1915. Um, penniless in a, um, in a uh, boarding house in New York City. And at that time, he had not seen either of his brothers in person for 20 years. So that's his story. In terms of descendants, um, except for Angelina, the playwright, the Black Grimke brothers had no surviving descendants, and Angelina had no children. So the bla as far as I have been able to tell, there are no Black descendants. However, <laughs> as the book was going, to, uh, going um, one of the things... I was talking to the editor about it, and we put it in a footnote, was that there is evidence that John had children out of wedlock um, with an African-American woman in Brooklyn who changed the last name to Grime, G-R-I-M-E. The child's birth certificate says Grimke. He's born, that child was born around the time that John Grimke is living in that part of Brooklyn and working as a waiter. Um, this woman was a member of the club that he claimed he was the head of. Oh. Um, I couldn't say in the book that this is like his child, but I did put in the footnote, right, you know, this could be a possibility. In which case, there could be a black Grimke descendant somewhere um, if this person survived. The white Grimke side, um, the descendants of the white Grimkees are very well documented. Edward Ball, the historian who wrote Slaves in the Family, his family intermarried with the Grimkees. Um, and so that side is still around. Another white relative lives in England, um, Drayton Grimke, um, and he actually has been very supportive when I was writing the book. You know, I, I emailed him and said, you know, I'm doing this book project. Um, you know, what sources would you suggest? And he was like, oh, look at this, this source that I hadn't even looked at. And like, look at this source. So he, he was great. But other than that, the Grimkes were notorious for being a family that other white Southerners talked about because their children didn't have as many children. Or if they had children, those children died, right? That's a question. Yes? Just, if you would, you brought up William Monroe Trotter in the book, and it was so brilliantly meaningful, uh, Dr. Greenwich, about how you wove all of that nuance together from the first book to the second, was there anything you wished you would put in to the first book that came out of this new research? I think, I think I, I, in the first book, um, talking a lot, uh, specifying or emphasizing more the way that Trotter's father, James Trotter, was kind of this, um, had a different way of being that was even different than his contemporaries. So William Rowe Trotter's father, James Trotter, had all these faults, of course, I talked about in the book, in the first book. One of the things that he, that stuck out to me when I was writing that first book was that James Trotter was very, very proud of being black and being descended from an enslaved person, which was an anomaly amongst this class of people at the time, right? And he would tell his children, people will try to tell you to be ashamed of being a descendant of enslaved people, don't be ashamed, right? I wish I kind of, um, emphasize that more because I think it had a huge effect obviously on the way Trotter's outlook and why often his outlook and the way he reacted to other people who might not have had that view or been raised that way, why he was so, he would have these outbursts at them, 
because his understanding was that, why are you ashamed of slavery, right? Um, and so that's something I, I definitely wish I had been able to do more, particularly since the Grimke family was so much, um, they did have so much shame, and part of what I say in the book, that shame was very much part of the class they were in, right? I, the, the, if you know that, I'll, I'll say this and I'll shut up, but the Kraft family, um, William and Ellen Kraft, wonderful story of them, you know, escaping from slavery, they disguise as a master and the, and the um, slave, after the Civil War, they become um, um, own a plantation that they had once been enslaved on in Georgia. Fabulous story. And the craft son writes to Grimke and says, my parents never tell me anything about their life. I read about it in a retrospective on William Lloyd Garrison. Why won't they tell us this? And Archie just says, well, they shouldn't tell us this because it's a shame. Right? So, you know, I, I think that uh, probably in the first book, I would have delved deeper into how very clearly, a, a different way of looking at that enslaved past um, had a different effect, kind of the radicalism effect, on someone like a trotter. Whereas the Grimke brothers were really deeply um, ashamed of the enslaved past and very ashamed that everybody knew about the enslaved past. Right? So it was, it was hard to say, this doesn't happen if people know you're living in New England and you're a Grimke and you're black, right? You know, everybody kind of knew this was the... the Probably this was the product of rape, right? Or sexual coercion, or whatever was happening in that household, right? And yet, um, you know, they're living in this environment where people are making kind of comments and whispers about their, their existence. Other questions? Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoy the book.